Hey class, uh, I hope you're uh, studying in preparation for finals and in this class and the rest are all going really well. Um, so today is the last class uh, that isn't just purely a review of, of all of the material we've gone over. Uh, so there's, uh, <laughs> there's uh, a bit of range that, that I hope to cover, uh, so let's jump into it. Um, so in, uh, for those of you that have had differential equations, uh, this maybe a little bit of a review and for those of you that haven't uh, or uh, have no intention <laughs> of taking differential equations if you don't have to uh, then uh, perhaps this uh, this will be as far into it as you get uh, so one of the problems that uh, was um, uh, conceived of and, and developed uh, since the invention of calculus was this model of uh, the stability of um, interactive systems of, of these dynamic systems uh, such as uh, the predator and prey model. So uh, the question that was asked was uh, how do these populations evolve where um, where these two systems, these two population sets are interacting with each other. So uh, like foxes and rabbits um, or uh, wolves and deer and so forth. Um, and uh, after some time, uh, they came up with a, a solution, uh, and it looked a, a little bit something like this. So uh, you can use um, these indexed values of x, where, where x1 uh, is the population of one species, and x2 is the population of another species. Uh, you can use x, y, and z uh, if you're only dealing with one or two or, or three species. Um, but if you're going to use... Uh, if you're going to represent an arbitrary number of systems, then uh, it's it's better to use these indexing uh, because um, you can have as many variables as you need, uh, and so it's uh, <laughs> you have to think a little bit more to to remember what those substitutions are. But uh, in the end, it's pretty helpful. Uh, and so the spirit behind these uh, systems of differential equations is uh, well, there's this interaction uh, and it, it makes it really difficult to define some function f of t or you know f of t and x or whatever uh, but it's a little bit easier to model um, how uh, the the rate of change for the population moves uh, with respect to uh, where the population is at and uh, with respect to where the population of, of these neighboring species are at uh, and so, uh, whenever discussing the model, uh, you can consider it in a vacuum, uh, like we did with uh, Fibonacci sequence and modeling the population growth for rabbits, where it's this uh, straight up exponential growth. Uh, but at some point, um, either uh, the rabbits will run out of resources, uh, you know, they will have consumed all of the available food, and you have to start considering starvation, uh, and or um, some species is going to learn how to catch and eat them uh, simply because there's just not enough places for them to hide. There's there's going to be some success rate for the species. Uh, and so um, the way that that was modeled is that uh, you would have uh, these these terms, a, a polynomial, potentially an exponential, you know, it's the Fibonacci, or, you know, we, we showed that recursive uh, sequences tend to have this exponential growth. Uh, especially whenever we solved for them, <laughs> we saw that you just assume, assume that it's something to the n, right? Um, anyway, uh, so you would have the the terms that model population growth just based on, on that single species, uh, and then uh, you would start to uh, add uh, these terms that include variables from from the other species or you know from other constraints. So uh, if it's a predator, then whenever there's an interaction, or, you know, as the two populations grow, uh, then the predators are going to to eat their food supply uh, until the food becomes scarce, and then they start, you know, uh, the the competition becomes a little too fierce, and and certain predators die off because they're not able to find enough food, um, and and so there's this decline in the population of the predators, while as the number of predators decline, the population of the prey is going to increase, and so there's this increase in the number of prey. Uh, while as the number of prey increase, then the predators 
uh, <laughs> now have abundant food supplies, and so their population increases, but this large predator population feeds on the rabbits and, and so forth, right? And so uh, the it, it moves in this cycle. Uh, and so when the problem was studied, it was, you know, asked, you know, uh, is there any stable point where where the populations don't grow and decline, where, where they seem to, to kind of have leveled off? Um, and so those are the solutions to, to these equations. Uh, but I think just modeling the equation itself is, uh, is, is both interesting and a bit of an achievement. Uh, and so I, I want to propose to you to, to view these equations uh, in more than just the predator-prey model. So uh, these same uh, rules of logic or, or rules of motion for these systems can be applied uh, in terms of um, not just predator-prey models, but in cooperative systems. Uh, so if you consider uh, the population of uh, corn or, or rice or uh, any of these plants that humans uh, feed on and, and the population of humanity, this is a, a cooperative system. So the more food that we are able to, to make, the larger population that we're able to support. Uh, and in a civilized society, the, the larger our population, uh, the more uh, farmland that we will cultivate and, and plant more of these, uh, these foods. Uh, and so uh, the populations increase with each other. So, uh, so the presence of one uh, even though they're, you know, we eat this food, uh, it still leads to this positive feedback in terms of the, the presence of the other because we, we don't eat it to exhaustion. We, uh, we ensure its continuity and, and we ensure its survival. Uh, and so in that case, uh, then these, these crossover terms uh, are going to be positive. There's going to be this positive feedback for, for both systems. Uh, whereas in the predator-prey model, one of these would be positive and one of them would be negative. So a lot of rabbits is good for, for the fox population, but a lot of foxes is bad for the rabbit population. Um, and then uh, there's uh, the competitive scenario where, um, it, where the presence of both is going to be a detriment to both. Um, so uh, you, you can look at that as uh, these two species maybe where uh, they eat the same food uh, and so, uh, you know, they they will compete with each other, but they don't necessarily have to, uh, you know, to attack each other directly. Uh, it's just enough that uh, that they can undercut each other by by taking uh, from one another and, and depriving the, each other of this uh, necessary resource. Um, and so, uh, that's the competitive scenario. Uh, and so with the co cooperative model, uh, I want to show that this goes beyond just, you know, species modeling or whatever. Uh, you can think of it in terms of um, the subjects that you're studying as an undergraduate student. So um, whenever we're young, uh, I, f I forget where I first heard this, I'm, I'm sure you know, it, was, it was my wife that told me, but uh, the, up to a certain point, maybe third grade, maybe sixth grade, I can't remember. Uh, we, uh, we are learning to read. We spend basically all of our efforts in, in learning how to read. And then after that point, or you know, once we reach this critical point, uh, we're no longer, we know enough about the English language that we can read, and now we are reading to learn. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's this point where uh, the, you know, it, all of that time invested uh, now benefits you in every area of study. Uh, you are no longer limited to what you're learning in class. You can learn anything that has been written down <laughs> at any point uh, in your native language or, or in any language that you speak. Uh, and if you speak English, then uh, that's a, a pretty significant uh, representation of, of uh, the human collective knowledge. Uh, and so uh, you can consider um, essentially every so one of these variables would be studying English or, or studying uh, you know the how to understand the written word uh, and every other subject would have one of these cross terms where uh, some number of hours invested in studying English or studying how to read uh, will at some point begin to pay off more than if you just studied that subject directly on your own so if you try to uh, reinvent the wheel or 
uh, you know, reinvent, uh, you know, uh, geometry or you know, algebra or, or do anything on your own. Uh, that you know, there's there's a certain amount of benefit to having studied uh, something that's slightly orthogonal to what it is that you actually want to know. Uh, and you can think of that as existing in in all of these other areas. Certainly in science, uh, if you invest some amount of time in studying mathematics, then uh, there's going to be another one of these cross terms where um, where studying calculus helps you to understand uh, physics. In fact, calculus was <laughs> was invented uh, in order to describe uh, you know these laws of motion, these these uh, physical phenomena that that Newton was studying, uh, and uh, and so there's. Uh, they they are intimately related in their creation, uh, or you know, in terms of uh, our uh, understanding of them. Uh, but you know, it, it certainly helps to understand the math uh, whenever you're going to study physics. And I would argue that it goes back the other way. So for me personally, uh, I found that uh, you know I, I always really enjoyed math, but whenever I got to the point that uh, I st started studying physics. Um, it, uh, it it lent a, a sense of imperative or you know it, it uh, gave purpose to these abstract notions that I was studying and uh, and it made it a little bit easier to study the math going forward I, I had these examples now in the real world that I can consider uh, and the math was now helping to explain it and so it, it made it easier in a sense because now I could visualize what it was that it was working on. And so for me personally, it went both ways that hours invested in math helped me to understand physics and hours invested in physics helped me understand math. Uh, and then you could argue even further, well, once you understand physics, then uh, you know, uh, certainly on a large scale, uh, you're, you're gonna be using you know, those Newtonian mechanics and so forth. Uh, but at the smaller scale, uh, it helps to understand what is going on with the atom and, and all of the energy levels and how essentially at the atomic scale all of the interactions is the story of how energy uh, changes state uh, and once you understand that then that will help you understand chemistry and, and the chemical bonds that are happening and uh, predicting whether or not certain uh, chemical interactions uh, will happen based on, on the exchange of energy levels and, and what's more likely to happen. Uh, and so if math helped physics and physics helped chemistry, then math also helped chemistry as well. And, uh, and uh, you know, chemistry uh, plays a, a, uh, an important role in the understanding of biology. Uh, and biology plays an important role in the understanding of, uh, of uh, you know, the human uh, psychology and, uh, you know, and so forth. Uh, and so, um, you know, you, you could consider, you know, that every one of these areas of subjects is going to have this positive feedback from uh, all of these other areas of, uh, of study that, uh, that you're going over now and that you've essentially spent your whole life uh, building up to, to this point. Uh, and so, uh, you know, whenever, whenever I was younger, uh, whenever I was going through the undergraduate program, uh, I, I remember, you know, always complaining that, you know, I, I really just enjoyed the, the math and computer science and software engineering classes, and, and I was a little bit annoyed that I had to invest this time in, in all of these other areas. Um, but uh, it, it takes a while to see the payoff, but eventually you do, uh, and uh, it's because of, of this, this, uh, this benefit that you will eventually see from this broad spectrum of understanding. And so that's... Uh, that's uh, in essence the the motivation, the intuition that we've been following all along in, in asking undergraduate students to uh, to go outside of their major to, to actually force them to take these electives and and uh, these other core classes that uh, that will sort of um, introduce this this broad spectrum of ideas that uh, will hopefully pay off down the line uh, and so. Uh, the subject that that I liked the least, whatever uh, I was younger, um, is probably the one that uh, plays, or you know, that uh, plays the biggest role in understanding uh, the world going forward, and and that's history. Uh, and so uh, the the reasoning behind that uh, is, uh, I, I think it's really well understood 
uh, if you consider the money hall the money hall problem uh, and so it was a, a famous uh, game show uh, and uh, you're given three doors and there's a prize behind one of the three doors uh, and so you get to pick which door uh, you're going to open and uh, or you get to pick which door you favor uh, and then the host money hall uh, comes along and he uh, and he tells you uh, okay I'm going there's two doors left so at least one of them is going to be the wrong door there's no prize behind it because there are three doors to start and there's only one prize and so he eliminates a door and you're guaranteed that the door that he takes away is not uh, the one with the prize behind it so in the end you're left with what appears to be a 50 50 proposition you can choose the door that you'd already set aside or you can choose the door that's prevent presented to you by the host which door has the prize behind it uh, well <laughs> you, you don't have a, a strict answer you have a, a probabilistic answer uh, and the answer surprisingly is that two-thirds of the time the door is behind the one presented to you by the host uh, and it's uh, it, it originates from uh, the original field of three. Uh, so, uh, here, let me draw this out a little bit for you. So, when you first started, you were given a field of three. Uh, and you could pick one that would would be the winner one third of the time. All right, so. so you have the one that you picked, and then there's the field, and so. In this case, in the original setup, it's very obvious that the answer is that the door that you chose uh, will win one third of the time and the field will have the winner two thirds of the time. So everything that you didn't choose will have the winner two thirds of the time. Uh, and so uh, it, it gets obscured a little and, and it's because these probabilities sit on top of one another that whenever you get <laughs> your chance to decide whether or not to, to change your choice, so the the host presents you with this other door, and now you can choose between these two doors, the one that you originally picked uh, or the one uh, that the, the host presented to you. Uh, and in actuality, because the original setup was a, a one out of three choice, uh, that those odds never went away. So even though there's only two doors now, you have a two-thirds chance of picking the winner if you switch doors whenever you're presented with the opportunity to change. Uh, and <laughs> But that 50-50 proposition is still there. So if you always choose your door, then your odds will collapse to a third of the time. You'll, you'll only win a third of the time. But uh, if, if you don't make up your mind until the end, then you'll win 50% of the time, uh, regardless of what you do, just by having not made up your mind, by flipping 50% of the time, uh, then you will still attain those 50-50 odds. And so it obscures it a little bit. But uh, if... 100% of the time you're rigid in your decision to change, to change to the door that came from the field, then you will attain those two, that two-thirds winning percentage over a long enough time. Uh, and so uh, this problem was again updated and uh, you know fairly recently uh, with uh, uh, I was gonna say uh, I, I thought it was let's make a deal but that, that's not it either. Um, it, it, uh, it'll come to me later, but uh, you know the the one with Howard Mandel and the twenty five suitcases. Right? Uh, okay, so it's it's a similar problem, but now you have a million dollars, and it's in one of these suitcases, and the others all have prizes ranging from a dollar to uh, you know scaling up uh, to that that million dollars. Um, but uh, it's a similar proposition. So uh, now you're eliminating the rest of these suitcases, and they show you what was in the suitcase. But let's say that you picked a suitcase at the very beginning from the field of 25 and you eliminate 23 suitcases so that now you have the, the one suitcase uh, that, uh, that you originally chose and then the, the field of 24 had one representative. So then which is the winner?
the the one that you chose at the beginning had just a, a one in twenty five chance. Um, but the field, the the champion of the field that's left over when you get to the end, uh, has a a twenty four in twenty five chance because it was it was not the the one in twenty five. It was the complement of the one in twenty five. So you would have uh, a 96% chance of winning um, if they did the Monty Hall rules. Now, the way that they've modified the game where you're choosing the suitcases to eliminate, uh, it, it kind of has this evolving probability as it goes on. Uh, but if they were to do it Monty Hall style, right, where uh, the host removes 23 losers for you and you're left with this apparent 50-50 proposition at the, time, at the end, then you would have a 96% probability uh, of winning the million dollars by switching at the end. Uh, and it's because it, it was the, the representative of, of the field. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this, this all kind of ties back to here, right? Uh, and so the, the idea here is that you're left with what appears to be a 50-50 chance, but the your odds of selecting a correct choice are improved by retaining a knowledge of history of how you got to that point uh, and uh, using that knowledge of history to inform your decision going forward. Uh, and so uh, history in terms of, of our uh, uh, understanding of the world and, uh, and our understanding of, of uh, how to act on it to make it better uh, or you know to uh, even just to improve our own situation uh, plays a, a huge role. So it's going to have a, a fairly significant cross term here. Uh, and uh, I would argue that, uh, you know, certainly in, in you know, global affairs and, and domestic affairs and, and even local affairs, like at the city level, uh, it, it plays a, a significant role to understand this and, and in running a business or, or anything. So uh, you're going to want a, a broad understanding of, of history and how you know the world has kind of moved as it's uh, as time has gone on, uh, but in terms of uh, research and scientific understanding and, and all of that, um, I, I would argue that yes, it's it's nice to have a, a really broad knowledge, but um, but the the proof or, or the essence of the proof, the the argument, I would say, because it's it's not a formal proof, but the argument is really easily understood uh, in in this setup, right? So uh, I think that um, that a lot of the advances that, that have yet to be made, that, that are coming and, and waiting, uh, will be more readily made um, through the, a broad understanding, through the perspective that we bring from, from these other subject areas. And, and it's, you know, it, it's seen through, uh, <laughs> through these interactive terms. So some subjects, some perspectives uh, are going to feed into each other. And, and while it's not you know, uh, mathematically rigor rigorous, uh, the argument and, and the essence of it uh, hold true where, um, where uh, you, you can bring some new information and, and the benefit, a, a disproportionate amount of benefit uh, from having spent a, a fair amount of time studying a broad range of subjects and then trying, uh, uh, using that broad knowledge to, uh, to attack your understanding of, of some new subject area. Uh, okay, so <laughs> that was the, the introduction. Uh, and so um, the, the rest of the class will discuss um, uh, security a little bit. Uh, I had wanted to discuss SQL injection, um, but I, I didn't have enough time to uh, set up um, you know, our, our understanding of SQL databases uh, to really go over it. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just mention it in passing that this is a, a security concern. Uh, and we discussed um, object relational mapping and uh, uh, as a means of you know, uh, linking your, your code uh, for your programs to databases. Uh, and one of the additional incentives there, uh, or you don't have to use object relational mapping for that, but uh, in whatever language you're using, uh, you uh, would <laughs> it is to your benefit to avoid uh, building SQL queries uh, dynamically just through string concatenation. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, something of this form.
so this is uh, you know just a <laughs> a blanket select statement for some table users, um, and so in by building this query through string concatenation, you see we haven't actually plugged in an ID. Uh, so the way, <laughs> the wrong way to do this, that I cannot emphasize this enough. The way that you will never do this is is this way, right? So you have this in some string, uh, and then you just add. Uh, so you have id dot two string, or you know, even worse if you don't have it that is guaranteed as a, a number. Um, then you just have id. Uh, okay, so if you haven't done a whole lot with HTML, then you'll eventually learn that that forms is a really popular way. Like an HTML form is a really popular way of getting data submitted, or you know, even if you don't, if you have if you've broken it up and you just have all of these input fields, then you extract it. And you don't necessarily need a form. You have a, an API. You can make the uh, XML HTTP request or the XHR request uh, and submit it. The API will process it. But if you read this in as a string, like you, you read it in as a string because it's easier, it gets rid of certain exceptions whenever you're trying to submit it, you know, or whatever it's because it's easy on some level well <laughs> you, you don't know enough about uh, databases presumably to, to know how bad this can get but you can actually lose all of your information through a single query so it's the the delete operations exist there um, because you should be able to to maintain your database if you have a record in there that you know, was added as either test data or, you know, is added erroneously or somehow it's a duplicate and you need to remove it. You need to be able to delete stuff. Um, and a lot of these tables, like users or, you know, emails or addresses or whatever, these are common table names because they're, they're brought forth by convention. So uh, any malicious user uh, could guess these table names. And so uh, ID isn't guaranteed to be what you think it is. Uh, it, it could be something completely different. So, um, so here ID is probably a number, but what if we used email, right? Then it's expecting it to be in a string. So they'll have the, the string opener right here. So that's if you know we we're writing it ourselves. It would be you know, something, so foo. But uh, this is a variable, so we'll use string concatenation to fill it in. So open quote, and then we close our string. Uh, and then we add the user email the one that they provided to us uh, and then we tack on that close quote so that we we get that you know foo or whatever in there right so then it's email equals and then the string of whatever this is uh, how could that go wrong uh, okay so <laughs> we'll we'll discuss it briefly and then we'll move on to SSL certificates uh, okay so what if email isn't what you think what if it's um, uh, well, what if it's not what you think? Then, if you haven't done any tests, you haven't done any sanity checks on it, uh, then it could be anything. In fact, you haven't guaranteed that it's not using uh, certain critical characters. Um, so, uh, imagine this scenario, right?
Uh, okay, so it, it's uh, it's a little tough to figure out what exactly is happening here, uh, but the idea is that you complete, so you have this close quote here, so this would fit in right here, right where email goes. So we close the quote, and you have this select star from users where email equals the empty string, so just open quote, close quote. And then semicolon, which terminates that first statement, and then the malicious user has provided you with an instruction to be executed with the same privileges as this select statement. So it's probably going to have the, the ability to update your database. Uh, and they guessed the table name users because it's popular. Could be user, could be users, uh, could be you know something else. But uh, you're going to want to use uh, these common table names because it, it makes sense. It's easier for you to maintain. Uh, and so they provide drop table users as a complete statement and then they close it off with a semicolon uh, and then they uh, uh, and then they just do select and then open quote and this open quote then is the end of this and so it gets tacked on with this other uh, close quote uh, and so they drop your users table and return an empty string uh, well, there's there's no recovering from that if you allow it to happen, uh, and it's because you you didn't test for these uh, special characters. Uh, but you know this and this is what's called a, a SQL injection attack. So uh, you're just uh, constructing these strings uh, in in a fairly naive manner, and someone that knows just a little bit more than you is able to uh, <laughs> to, uh, to just have a bit of fun with you to to cause trouble with you for no reason. Uh, and that's that's uh, pretty serious. So this is uh, essentially the best case. In the worst case, they find some way to uh, to ma manipulate your system to extract all sorts of data that should be private. Um, and so you you cannot allow that either. Uh, and um, you can write your own logic to try and deal with these special characters that kind of need to be escaped or whatever. But every library that you use to interact with the database is going to provide you some mechanism uh, to deal with these scenarios. So they'll escape it, and this will all become, you know, just some string, and and you'll get that the email, or you'll you'll get what you expect that that email doesn't exist. That drop table users <laughs> is not a valid email, or or whatever. It's not an email in your database. Uh, and so if you want, you know, you can check the string, just make sure that it's a valid email using some regular expression. Um, but the, the prescribed way uh, is to uh, register it as a, a parameter, so a, a variable on its own, and then the database will enforce that, uh, that the stuff that's inside the string uh, is not being executed. So that'll look something more like Uh, and so for, for SQL Server, uh, it'll be something of this format. So you declare uh, that there's some parameter named at email, uh, and then uh, all of that other stuff that's going on can't happen. Uh, and so it takes a little bit more time. I know that whenever you're first starting out, there's this rush to kind of um, to just get something out so that you can prove that you know you're you're good at your job or whatever. Uh, but uh, allowing for SQL injection is a catastrophic error. At best, you lose all of your data. At worst, you're leaking data. Uh, and um, both scenarios are, are, are terrible. It's as bad as it can get. Uh, so spend a little bit of extra time whenever you start off uh, and learn how to use uh, parameters uh, for these queries uh, and then update statements as well so that uh, you guarantee that uh, it, it provides this additional guarantee that whenever you're interacting with these fields that you're not providing malicious values to your database. Uh, okay, so that's SQL injection. That's a fair concern, uh, but very easily uh, mitigated against uh, once you learn how to use uh, database parameters for your queries. Uh, okay, so the next one uh, is transport layer security, so TLS. So uh, I think we discussed briefly the TCP ISP stack. Uh, and so the transport layer was one of the layers. 
Uh, and so, um, essentially, you can configure your application to to interact in a way uh, that, as the data is going out, it gets encrypted, and that's what TLS is. Uh, and this is done through um, SSL certificates, secure socket layer certificates. Uh, it's part of the protocol that gets used. Uh, and essentially, you create an SSL certificate, and then you register it with uh, with both your application and with the operating system. Uh, and then uh, it kind of happens on its own. You don't have to encrypt the data as you're sending it out. You just respond normally. So it's the same for HTTP and HTTPS. Uh, but the difference is whenever you're using this protocol, whenever it's registered, uh, then after you've sent your response, um, you know, there's this stack of, of operations that happen. So your response gets sent and then it gets you know, packaged and so forth. And, and in the transport layer, uh, it gets encrypted. Uh, and then uh, the other side will know how to decrypt it and the application won't really have to interact with it in any special way. It, it kind of all happens transparently. So it's not a lot of extra headache in terms of uh, programming effort. Um, but uh, there is a little bit of uh, a barrier to entry that you have to be a little bit familiar with, with how it all works and, and how it's structured. Uh, and so I hope to, uh, to pay that barrier to entry with you today uh, as we go through this tutorial. So uh, we are going to do more than just create a single uh, SSL certificate or uh, you know, a certificate signing request, which is uh, really where, where you'll probably start. So you'll go to some uh, authority and then you'll say okay this is who I am I work for this company and this is our the certificate we would like for you to use uh, you know can you sign it with your authority and then we can publish it with our website it'll become our, our public key you know, it's part of the public key encryption uh, and then it, you know if, if all of that once all of the work is done once all the legwork is done uh, then uh, you'll have your SSL certificate and your traffic can be encrypted and it's usually good for about a year at a time. Uh, but then, you know, how does the certificate authority, <laughs> you know, operate and, and particularly the signing authority. Uh, and so uh, that kind of happens in, in three layers, right? So, Uh, okay, so at the top, there's this root certificate authority, uh, and you know, these were all started, you know, basically, it, they may have gone before the 90s or whatever, but, um, you know, in, in the 90s and 2000s, uh, they were set up, and, you know, they, um, they kind of built a business on top of it, uh, and uh, the root certificate authority authorizes an intermediate certificate authority and that intermediate authority is still the same business entity as the root authority um, but it's one layer of uh, indirection now one layer removed from the root certificate authority in case somehow it you know something leaks something happens and they get compromised well it's it's not every certificate that they've ever issued that's compromised it's everything coming from that intermediate certificate authority that's compromised. So uh, in that regard, it's like a, a try-catch block. And so this is the try-catch. So try and issue all of these certificates. And if something happens, well, then we've stopped it. And it, it doesn't, you know, <laughs> we're not you know, totally uh, in trouble. We, we at least have this fallback. And we can you know recreate everything. Um, so the intermediate certificate authority is actually the, the entity that you'll go to and you'll request to sign your certificate. Uh, and so, um, the root certificate authorities, uh, you know, there's this question, well, okay, how do I know who to trust? Well, your operating system has gone through the legwork and, and they've figured out who is trustworthy uh, and they designated them uh, before you even install the operating system. So Linux comes with all of these pre-trusted certificates.
certificate of authorities and it's it's essentially the same set uh, as uh, are trusted by um, by um, Microsoft Windows and and by uh, Apple's uh, Mac OS and and on all of our phones and so forth uh, it's it's essentially the same set of, of entities uh, and so uh, it's it's a really big deal to you know add some new root level certificate authority uh, and um, I I don't know anything beyond that in terms of how you actually uh, gain entry into it, but I do know that uh, you know starting a new one and getting it trusted is is going to be a big deal, uh, if only because there are so many, like uh, there's already so much inertia, right? So all of these operating systems all exist, uh, and it's it's kind of a big deal to push updates and stuff. So um, uh, so it's rare that something gets added at that level. Uh, but once you have that root layer of trust, then the intermediate certificate authority uh, is really just whoever this guy authorizes. Uh, so you know, there's this trusted root certificate authority, and then any claim to some you know, uh, descendant level of authority uh, can be verified using nothing other than the certificates, the, the root one that's the public certificate that's already installed, uh, and then the one that the intermediate CA is providing. Uh, and so uh, that chain, you know, is, is somewhat flexible. Like it, uh, it can be entirely provided by, by you, that final certificate. Uh, and so they can verify it all the way up to the root certificate authority uh, just using uh, the, the certificate provided um, by that lowest level service. So whatever website you've set up and so forth. Um, but uh, the exercise that we're going to go through today, and, and hopefully we'll have enough time to, to actually get through it, uh, I, I think we may go over a little bit, or, or I may have to cut it short. Um, but we'll create a root certificate, uh, and then I'll discuss um, on a network that you control, uh, you can add your own trusted root uh, level certificate authority. Um, and it's sufficient because you control it, you can install the certificate on all of the servers, and then you can, you know, control uh, all of the certificates that get assigned on your network. Uh, and so there are certain cases where this is helpful. In most cases, you would want to go through some public authority. If you're going to be interacting, you know, on a public level, then then you're going to want you're you're going to need that. You're going to need some trusted third party. Um, but if it's your own network, uh, then um, then you are root, <laughs> and so it's it's enough that you say that uh, you know a, a certain machine or a certain service uh, has authorization for certain actions. Um, okay, so uh, so what does it look like whenever uh, we we do one of these um, certificate authorities? Uh, okay, um, let's see. So uh, we'll start with a, a directory. Uh, some root directory and then we'll create everything within it um, so uh, let's create a directory it's just a uh, root CA uh, and then within it uh, we're going to create a directory for uh, the public certificates, uh, the certificate revocation list. So if, if something gets compromised, then you need some way to track uh, what's been removed. So the CRL is that. Um, the, uh, the requests, so uh, I mentioned something about a uh, certificate signing request, so that's going to be uh, in the request directory, uh, and then the private keys. Uh, and uh, whenever you generate your own certificate, you will hold the private key. You don't actually have to, to hand that out. Um, oh, uh, it wants us to create these one by one. Uh, okay, uh, and then 
uh, we need some file uh, to track uh, the serial numbers so that we know whenever we revoke it, we're revoking by serial number. Um, and so we'll start our serial numbers off with the number 1000. Oh, uh, no, sorry, the index will be maintained by OpenSSL application. Uh, and our serial number will be tracked here. So if you think of a database, then this is um, like the, the primary key uh, serial number where it just gets incremented automatically. Uh, and so you can see that we're providing these files that, that kind of act as a database. Uh, and so you can have something more robust that uses an actual database, uh, but uh, OpenSSL on a very small scale uh, will allow you to kind of maintain this stuff on your own. Uh, and then next we need uh, the configuration file. And so I have one that's predefined, but uh, you're going to have to give me just a moment to track that down. Okay. Uh, and so this is a configuration file for uh, OpenSSL. And we can walk through it really quickly. Uh, and so uh, you'll see that there's these headers. Uh, so this is the CA section. Uh, and then it refers this default configuration refers to this section. Uh, and so uh, there's this directory uh, where we would expect everything to live. Uh, and uh, we're not using this directory, we're using the one uh, that we created for this. So let's uh, copy this location. Yeah. Uh, and then we have to escape all of the backslashes. Uh, if <laughs> it's just because backslash is itself the escape character. Uh, if you're on Linux or Mac uh, and you're using four slashes, then you don't have to do this stuff. Uh, and then within this directory where we're creating our root certificate authority, uh, then we have uh, each of these uh, you know, subfiles and, and subdirectories. Um, and then uh, here we've called CSR requests. So we need to change that. Uh, CRL is the same, public is the same, and private is the same. Uh, and then serial, where it looks for the next serial number and, and maintains that file is there. Uh, and the RAND file um, is uh, going to help us with generating the prime numbers. So uh, public key encryption is done using these uh, prime number pairs of digits with uh, uh, 100 digits long, somewhere between uh, 100 and uh, 300. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's seeded with these random numbers and then it begins its check based on this random uh, number so that not everyone generates the same uh, pair of uh, uh, prime numbers. Uh, but the seed is maintained in this RAND file. Uh, okay, uh, so um, this is going to be the name of our private key uh, and we'll call it uh, discrete certificate authority uh, in honor of our class. Um, the this maintains the list of uh, serial numbers that have been revoked. Uh, so uh, it's maintained in the CRL directory. We don't have to do a whole lot there. Uh, and then this is the information for the default setup. Um, so whenever we have a signature, what do we want to use? Uh, so we're using SHA-256. Uh, presumably we could use SHA-512 if we wanted, uh, but um, this is fine. Um, and then the number of days that we issue the certificate for, for. So it's just over a year, but this is configurable. We can choose it. We can choose something significantly longer if we want. Um, uh, and then this is all information that um, you know, 
country name, state, province, or whatever, that gets included on the public certificate, and we'll take a look at that once it's created. Um, and then, uh, again, so whether you're using a strict policy or a loose policy, and these are just names that we've given it, uh, what we want the, the default setup to be. Uh, and so in theory, if you're using a loose policy or what we're calling a loose policy, uh, then each of these fields is optional. Um, okay, uh, and so for the root certificate, uh, we're going to use a, a longer encryption key. So it's uh, 4,096 um, bits long, so four kilobytes, or yeah, four kilobytes. Um, okay, uh, no, four kilobits, sorry. Uh, okay, and then you know it, it continues on. So these are the, the default values provided here, um, and then uh, there's these uh, extensions uh, that get tacked on. So how you're going to use the key for digital signature for signing certificate revocation lists, and that's really only something that the certificate authorities, the root and the intermediate, would use. Uh, and then um, you can imagine, like you can use these SSL certificates to actually authenticate. Uh, and so uh, we've defined that here. Uh, and then uh, for a server, uh, you can use it um, uh, both for digital signature usage uh, as well as uh, encrypting your, your traffic. Right? Uh, or um, more likely uh, because RSA is a little bit expensive and uh, uh, AES uh, is the preferred method for stream ciphers, uh, you use this key to encrypt an AES key. Uh, and so all of the traffic, all of the main traffic uh, happens uh, using the advanced encryption standard. But uh, the key, <laughs> the symmetric key that's provided there uh, happens uh, using this uh, asymmetric encryption using RSA uh, and so you just encrypt a key you encrypt a secret uh, whenever someone connects to your website uh, and then that secret that's provided through this RSA encryption uh, is then used to to encrypt all of the streamed traffic um, and so your <laughs> uh, this just gets you that initial handshake so that you can agree what that secret should be, and then you can use something that's a little more efficient in terms of encryption. Um, but it's still critical to make that handshake in a secure manner, otherwise you can't uh, have secure traffic. Um, okay, uh, and so you can see all of these other uh, uh, classes of, of information essentially. Uh, and so uh, the CRL list is one method for verifying that a certificate is still valid, that it hasn't been revoked. Uh, and then there's a, a new protocol, OCSP. Uh, I can't remember uh, what exactly the, uh, the letters stand for, but uh, it's an alternative to certificate replication lists, and it uh, allows you to essentially query the certificate authority to see whether or not a certificate that you're looking at has been revoked. Um, okay, so most of this will be unchanged. Um, so now that we've defined it, we can use this configuration instead of having to provide everything through the command line to OpenSSL. Uh, and uh, you do have to install OpenSSL separately. Um, so uh, if you're on Linux, uh, it's probably already installed. And I want to say that it's also installed on Mac as well by default, uh, but on Windows uh, you'll have to look up OpenSSL uh, and download it. Uh, download one of the binaries. Uh, so the source code is there. Uh, one of these is going to be a binary that you can actually download. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's beyond the scope of this class. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you just uh, download one of the pre-built versions and, and you can use it on Windows like I am. Uh, okay, uh, so 
we have the configuration file prepared. Now uh, we want to create the root key. So Uh, so we want to generate the RSA key uh, and we're going to use it to generate uh, AES keys of length 256 bits uh, and then we called it discrete called it this uh, and so this is defined in our configuration uh, so we're going to want to make sure that this file name agrees so discrete ca .key .pem. Uh, and this .pem extension uh, you'll recognize it if you've ever looked at any one of these keys in terms of the file um, but it was this standard that was created um, Okay, so it was a standard that was created to send encrypted email. Uh, so eventually we decided, okay, well, we actually want our email clients to be these websites, and so we'll use HTTPS, and, and we won't actually send email over the network. Uh, but originally that, that wasn't really known, so email was sent clear text over port 25, SMTP, uh, and then uh, someone came along and was like, well, you know, I, I'm really not comfortable with everyone being able to read my email. So we need this standard to encrypt the email. Uh, and that standard died off, uh, except through these SSL keys. So the format by which it's encrypted, uh, you know, by which it's encoded, uh, is, is what we use now for uh, these SSL keys. Uh, but it was originally developed for uh, <laughs> encrypted email, which I think is really interesting. Um, Okay, so we need to enter some password for the file so that we can decrypt this file. Uh, and it really doesn't matter. I'm going to choose discrete. Uh, you can choose whatever you want. Uh, and uh, you can actually see the choice uh, for the exponent that's used here, and this is pretty standard. Uh, it's 65537, which is uh, 2 to the 16 plus 1. Uh, and this is the hex form for it. Um, right. uh, and so this is hex, not binary. Uh, so that uh, you can see why uh, it, it's not binary. So uh, this is actually 2 to the 16. Yeah. Uh, OK, so we have this file. And we can actually go take a look at it here. Okay. And so this, this should look familiar if you've ever looked into it. Um, and so it tells you how the file is encrypted. It's encrypted with AES-256, and we have the password, so it'll be symmetric. The same password that encrypted it will decrypt it. Uh, and this is this is our key. This is our uh, the encoded and encrypted form uh, of our um, private key, our uh, our two uh, prime numbers, our two very long prime numbers. It's encoded right here. Uh, okay, uh, so then now that we have our, our root certificate, uh, we need to uh, create a certificate request and then we need to sign it ourselves. Uh, and so the command for that uh, is again invoke through SSL. We're creating a request, we're using the config uh, that we created a little bit earlier, we're using the private key. That we had just created. Uh, it's a new request. It's an X509 certificate. Uh, it's good for, uh, we'll say, uh, I don't know, something like five years uh, or a little less than that. We'll say 1500 days. Um, and then uh, we want it encoded, or we want it. Uh, Hashed. We want a digital signature of SHA-256. Uh, the extensions is going to be a certificate authority, this V3CA. Uh, right here. 
So all of the little addendums that get made to our certificate uh, are going to come from this section. So if you need to add anything, uh, then you would add it to this section. Uh, okay. Uh, and then we say where we want the output file. Uh, and that's going to go in public. Same file name, but instead of .key, it's .cert, cert or certificate, uh, and then the password to access the private key, uh, and then this is the information that will show up on the certificate, uh, so uh, we're going to use all of the default stuff. common name, uh, it's whatever we want it to show up on the management console. Um, we're not going to install it, I'll, I'll show you where you would install it, but uh, the common name can be anything you want. Uh, so we'll call it discrete math root ca, and then we don't need to provide an email. Uh, okay, so now we have another new file, I don't think we have a request yet. Uh, and again, it's in this uh, private encrypted mail format. Uh, but we can actually read this uh, using um, OpenSSL. And so this is the the format of it once you decrypt all of the data. Um, and so it's got a serial number. Um, it has a, an, a certificate version number. Um, this is all of the information that we entered, uh, including our common name, uh, the start date and the expiration date for our certificate. So it expires in 2025. Um, the modulus, which is the, the product, uh, I don't think we created a 4 kilobyte uh, product, it looks like it's 512 bits. Uh, so this is, uh, this is actually fairly easy to break, you're going to want to use much, much stronger uh, encryption if you're going to create a, a root certificate for your domain. Uh, but we're not going to go back and redo it uh, because we uh, are going to run out of time as it is. Um, okay, uh, and then in particular, it should show who the issuer is. Yeah, so the issuer was us. <laughs> we, this is a self signed one. So the issuer and the subject are the same. Uh, and that's really just the case for the root certificate. Um, okay, uh, so you can play around with that a little bit if you want. Uh, so now we want to create the intermediate authority, so the one that actually ends up issuing all of these other certificates. So this is that layer of indirection, the try-catch, if you will, on a business level. Uh, so uh, I don't think we have an intermediate directory, so let's make it. Uh, and then uh, we're going to do basically the same thing. We're going to create um, a public directory, a private directory, a certificate revocation list directory, uh, and a CSR directory or request directory. Uh, and then, uh, as before, we need both an index to act as a database for the certificates we've issued. Uh, and then we need a serial file. And the serial file, again, we'll start with serial number 1000. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so now we have a, a new uh, configuration file. So the other one was the configuration for the root CA. Uh, but now uh, we need one 
for the intermediate. need to make a couple of updates. So as before, this directory needs to be updated. And then we have to escape all of the backslashes. Uh, and then uh, we change this to requests. And everything else was the same. Uh, this is now going to be the discrete intermediate certificate. And everything else is the same. Using SHA-256, certificates are good for 375 days by default. Um, these are the policies of whether or not we want to require these fields. Uh, default bits, 2048. Uh, should be okay. The other one should have been 4096, but I must have provided some parameter that overrode it, so we'll pay attention. Um, okay, and then the default values for requests, uh, whenever we're uh, creating them. Uh, and then the usages as before. Um, yep, okay, all looks good. Uh, so now we can go on uh, and we can create the private and then public keys. Um, so we're going to generate an RSA key, so our private keys. Uh, we're going to store it in an encrypted file, an AES-256 encrypted file. Oh, uh, and then this would be the URL uh, that uh, it, this actually gets stamped into your certificates whenever you sign them. Um, and so the certificate provides a location where someone can verify whether or not the, the, the cert that's being looked at has been revoked. Uh, and this is that endpoint where, uh, where anyone that wanted to verify it would go. Um, okay. Uh, so we named our file discrete int key. Oh, and this is where I dropped the ball before. Uh, and so then we say how many bits we want it. Uh, and so this one we want it to be 4096. And so it'll take a, a longer time. And you can see just by the number of dots <laughs> that it's printing out while we wait. Um, to generate this longer key. So, um, so I'll use the same password on this one. It's terrible policy, but we're not actually using these. It's just an exercise. Uh, okay, so we can see that we have a, a new private key. And you can see that this one is much longer than the root one, uh, which it would normally be the opposite. Normally the, the root key would be the longer of the pair. Um, so, uh, so if you do decide to create one of these for your, your home network, make sure you use the longer uh, key length, uh, this 4096 at the end, to indicate that you want it to be longer. Um, and, uh, and it will be much tougher to crack. Um, you can still break the encryption given enough time, but you're buying yourself 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever, by using these longer key links. Uh, and so uh, for all practical purposes, uh, that's, <laughs> that's usually enough time. Uh, but um, you know, if, if you need more security than that, you're, you're going to want to consider um, other alternatives. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but for general purposes, uh, in terms of financial traffic where things expire after you know four years or whatever uh, this is enough you know. uh, okay so uh, intermediate security or intermediate certificate 
and then we need to create the request and then the request will be authorized by the root um, and then I'll make a couple of comments on how we'll install it and we'll be done uh, so we won't actually generate a server certificate but it's the same as creating the intermediate one in that you create the request and you provide it to a certificate authority the certificate authority uh, signs it and then you know passes it back uh, so the request is made open SSL request it the private key uh, and then we tell it where we want the certificate request to go Fonts are fine, the common name. Um, let's see, what did we use as the common name before? Discrete math root CA, so discrete math intermediate CA sounds good. Okay, creates the request, uh, and so we can see that here. So now we take this and we give it to the root certificate authority and we say, please sign this. And in the case of a server certificate, so if you wanted one for your website, uh, then you would take it and you would provide it to the intermediate certificate authority and it would provide that. Um, okay, so let's move up a directory since we have to act as the root CA now. So we're gonna do a certificate authority action. So open SSL CA. We're going to use the config in this root CA directory. Uh, we're going to use the set of uh, extensions provided by uh, this heading. So if you go to the root CA, B3 intermediate CA, so we're using this set whenever we sign it. We're going to authorize it for, we gave the other one five years, which was 1,500 days, so we'll give this one half of that. So we'll say this is good for about two years, so 750 days. Um, we don't want it to print it out to the screen. Uh, we want to uh, use the 256 hash. SHA-256. Uh, the input file is in the request directory. Uh, and then the output file is going to be in our public directory. And it's going to have the same root name. but a certificate instead of a CSR, and then again the .pem extension. And so tells us everything. Are we sure that we want to sign this? Yes. Commit. Uh, okay, so see that the serial number's been updated. We see that the index file now has a record, so these are, this is the list of certificates that have been issued, still valid. Um, okay, uh, so it, it does act as a little database, this index.txt, uh, but it's it's very simple and it's meant to be on a very small scale. Uh, okay, so we can now verify, if we go to the intermediate, We can verify our X509 certificate. Uh, and we can 
can see everything that was authorized. So there's the key itself. Uh, there's everything that we claim. This is the period that it's valid for, and so forth. Uh, okay, so uh, if you were to manage your own uh, your own root certificate authority, then you would go to the in Windows, you would go to the Windows Management Console. Uh, the path is different for Linux and for, for Mac. Um, and then uh, certificates, snap in. We'd want to do it on the computer level. Uh, and then uh, the trusted root certificate authorities. So you want to be very careful <laughs> about adding these. Uh, so you want to make sure, absolutely sure that you're the only one that controls it if you're adding one, because it's very easy to create a man in the middle attack from here. Uh, and then these are all the ones that you already trust. Uh, and so you would just um, you would import a new certificate. So uh, all of these have these uh, PFX or P12 or whatever. Um, but we should be able to import it with the .pem extension. If not, then we could use OpenSSL to create one of these PFX files. Uh, and it's actually a a pairing of the public and the private certificates uh, and then it's uh, encrypted behind a password as well um, okay so uh, that's essentially how you would do it how you would go through the, the mechanics of creating your own certificate authority which is a, a level beyond actually creating a, a simple certificate request so uh, if you're using IIS and you create a, a certificate request or if you're using something else uh, then you're in essence doing the same work and then whenever they sign it they're doing the work of, of signing it they're handling the certificate request just like we just did in creating that intermediate certificate authority uh, okay so uh, so I will uh, create and get to you uh, the review sometime before Thursday uh, I will post the solutions the exam will be posted on Friday uh, and then um, you'll be given uh, until Wednesday of next week because I, I need time to grade it. Uh, so you'll be given the weekend and, and nearly a week. Uh, and I've been oscillating, you know, uh, on uh, exactly what I'm going to put on it. So we'll, we'll go over that a little bit on Thursday. Um, we'll do a review for, for the entire course. Um, the exam will, uh, it, it'll sample bits from, from throughout the course. Uh, but if you've done well on the previous exams, there's no reason to think that you won't do really well on this one. Uh, and uh, if not, well, there's always time for improvement. I, I would actually still expect everyone to do pretty well. Um, okay, uh, well, uh, have a great evening, and I will talk to you on Thursday.